Postcards from Nebraska on RFD-TV, a program about rural life. This week, join Roger Welsh for a look at preservation in the plains. First, she's listed in the phone book simply as the Turtle Lady, a woman who is single-handedly trying to rescue the Sandhills box turtle from the hazards of the road. In the not too distant future, could good clean water be as scarce and valuable as oil? Roger takes a look at the factions fighting for more H2O. Plus, join with a band of volunteers who are determined to bring back the cobbled streets of their town one brick at a time. And finally, visit a summer camp where Native American kids learn more about their nearly forgotten culture and heritage. It's all this week on Postcards from Nebraska. I've always been attracted to turtles because there's sort of mystery about them. They are just so self-sufficient, you know, they have everything they need right on their back. It's easy to be concerned about the welfare of Great Plains creatures as heroic as the eagle or the bison, or as cuddly as the deer or antelope. But who's going to worry about something as common as the ordinary turtle? The principal hazard they have is when they got wind up crossing a road. That's right. People are the principal hazard. The Sandhills box turtle is native to northwest Nebraska. It's cold-blooded, not very social, quiet, determined, not very threatening, but also not very majestic. I just try to find the best possible location for them so they'll never run into people or cars again. So who does care? The turtle lady, that's who. Let's see, which way was he going? He was going that way. He was going that's how Angelica Byorth is listed in the phone book. The turtle lady, that's the title on her business card. Him across the road. If we take him back that way, he'll just start into the road again. <laughs> well, he's got a long ways to go so, before Angie Byorth yeah. thinks turtles are as important as eagles. He just wants Beautiful. to get on the road again. Oh, isn't he? Just a gorgeous, gorgeous specimen. I guess I also admire them because they've been around for so long. They've been here before dinosaurs. There really aren't any predators to speak of. They can just totally draw in. I'll try to do it once. He's going to bite you. He's mad. He's mad. <laughs> See, but I, I'm trying to show you how he can close up his shell without getting bit. Well, Boy, he is you. aggressive. You can tell he is a male for sure. The females aren't like that. Today, Angie is returning some turtles she's rescued and repaired, in some cases brought back from the brink of death, to their natural homes in Nebraska's hills and streams. I swear they can smell huh. the sand hills air and the sand. They know their They home. know their home. What are you releasing today, Angie? There's nine ornate box turtles. Uh, here's one of the nine that uh, are going right here into the sandy, hilly, very desolate area. Some you get kind of attached to when you have them a while. And when they're just exceptionally pretty, uh, then it's hard for me to let them go too. It's, there's something in me, I want to hang on to it because it's so beautiful, but. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people, Angie, would look at that and have a hard time finding it as beautiful. True. <laughs> it takes a special eye to see the beauty in a turtle, but um, to me, they've always been very unique, very unusual, and uh, very beautiful. I've always liked turtles. They have something of eternity about them. They haven't changed much over the past few millenniums, haven't needed to. Since they are doing pretty well as they are, they haven't felt much need to move in another evolutionary direction. Slow and steady. Stick with what works. Don't worry. Don't hurry. Their only natural enemy is people in the fast lane. During their lifetime, each of this type of turtle roams within a one to five mile radius. And that's quite a little area. If he's lucky, he might never come this direction again. He might head off five miles this way. Huh and just stay over there until he's 100 years old, which is his... They live uh, that long? Yeah, 50 to 100 years. And so if he's lucky, um, he'll never come back here. All right. 
this has to be a big moment for you after taking care of them and finally bringing them back home. Yes, uh, this is kind of the um, icing on the cake. <laughs> Three weeks ago, she was so ill, I thought she was going to die from pneumonia. And look how nice she, oh, looks. she looks. good. Nice bright eyes. And... Very nice. Very healthy again. And uh, she's so heavy, I can tell that if we x-rayed her, we'd probably see a bunch of eggs. So you not only saved her, but also film. all of her children. That's right. And this is just perfect. You know, she'll just get right into the sand here somewhere and dig a hole and lay her eggs and walk away. Uh, and then they take care of themselves. That has to make you feel good, Angie. Boy, I sure do like to release them. Let's just let them all go at the same time. There. Oh! Well, that's a big one, Angie. Boy, that is a big what, turtle. What happened to her? This 25-pound, 30 to 40-year-old snapping turtle was left for dead by a reckless driver, then saved by a passing motorist and a veterinarian, and finally nursed to health by Angie Byorth. It was bloody, and animal control took her to Dr. Terry Pitts, who's worked on turtles like this for me since the 70s, and he fixed it with dental cement. And so she's ready to go back. She's ready to go back. The other thing that happens when they're full of eggs, they don't eat, and so she hasn't eaten for three weeks, and she's getting a little thin, but this is her best shot and uh, any longer, I don't think she'd make it. Not much in the way of thanks here. No drama. Just one turtle at a time. One more sick creature nursed back to health, headed off into the Nebraska sand hills to continue with the unfinished business of being a turtle. Just like 10 million generations before, and hopefully just like 10 million more yet to come. With special thanks from all of us to the turtle lady. Well, he's taking right off. He's getting out of here. If I was him, I'd go too. <laughs> I sent you a lot of postcards about the parched prairies of America's Great Plains. Well, this one isn't about the land. I want to show you something. This is Nebraska's most unlikely and most controversial resource, water. While wars rage around the world over oil, a war in America is building over water. California wants more water for its high consumption agricultural industry. Denver wants unrestricted supplies of water for its suburban lawns and car washes. Nebraska wants water from the Rockies so we can grow more corn, of which Colorado indignantly notes we already have a surplus. Even among Nebraskans who share the same river valley, there is considerable disagreement about how its water should be handled. Nebraska is named for the Platte River, Nebraska, and Platte being the Omaha and French words for the same thing, broad, shallow water. And the Platte is broad and shallow, except here. Behind me is one of the world's largest earthen dams, holding back Lake McConaughey on Nebraska's Platte River. Fishermen, swimmers, water skiers want enough water held in this reservoir to support their recreational activities. Hey, tourism is a big business here. It brings in a lot of money to the western part of the state. The same color money as agriculture. The Platte is 142 feet deep at the dam and two miles wide. Farmers want water running out of the dam through canals from which it can be drawn for crops. What could be more practical than using water to grow food? Power advocates want the water to run through turbines to generate electricity. Naturalists want a minimum flow to support wildlife, eagles, sandhill cranes, deer, fish, the very things that make this place what some people call the good life. 
Developers argue that historically, these rivers went dry almost every year anyway. So why make them something they've never really been? Recreational vehicle owners love to roar up and down the white sand riverbeds when the water is gone. Conservationists mourn the resultant loss of nesting areas and the destruction of habitat. Others of us resent the uninvited invasion of our peace and quiet. California's problem is often attributed to a misunderstanding of geography. People trying to grow crops on land that is by nature a desert. Well, that's the problem here too. People on the Great Plains even laugh at the idea that this rich land might once have been called the Great American Desert. And yet we haven't lived here long enough to know what really does work on the Great Plains. More importantly, is water going to test this nation's resolve as repeated oil crises have done? Is that going to happen with our water too? Are we going to have to go through that whole mess all over again? Are we going to ignore this dilemma until it becomes a problem and then a crisis and finally a catastrophe? Well, that's the good news, the similarities between oil and water. The bad news is that unlike oil, there is no substitute for water. Nebraska, progress has run into a major roadblock, you should excuse the expression. The phrase Seward's Folly, originally referring to the purchase of Alaska, has taken on a whole new meaning here. These brick streets, what's left of them, go back to the beginning of the century. Over the years, many of them were torn up. But here in Seward, the clock is running backwards as volunteers work to return the town to its previous bricked glory, especially around its historic courthouse square. There's a lot of history in our town uh, having to do with brick streets. We had a brick factory in Seward, even though they didn't uh, create the... Mike Clintworth sees the bricks as a metaphor for the town. It's a lot of the buildings downtown had uh, bricks from our local factory. Uh, our downtown area being on the National Register of Historic Places, people uh, really wanted to keep up the history. There was a time when that sound, these bricks, symbolized a big step forward. They were progress. Frontier streets were dusty messes all summer long. All winter, rutted bone jars. Spring and autumn, bottomless swamps. Brick pavement, on the other hand, was a sign of prosperity, permanence, progress. The town with a brick main street was here to stay, moving no way but up. Not anymore. What we need, some proclaim, is cement and asphalt, like everywhere else. Mike Clintworth, local businessman, decided Seward's brick streets were worth hanging on to. He started a volunteer movement to bring the bricks back. You might call Mike Clintworth's minions the stick to the bricks volunteers. We got a call on a Thursday afternoon that they were ready for some volunteers. And uh, by the noon the following day, we had the first full week of volunteers scheduled. To Mike, the gentle rumble of Brick Street's echoes of heritage. I think a lot of the young people really have warmed up to the fact that there is, uh, besides the aesthetic side, uh, the emotional appeal, there's a real economic case to be made. The brick streets we're standing on have been here 80 to 90 years, uh, almost in perfect shape. If these bricks have stood up this well for 80 years, Mike and his supporters argue, then why not keep them for another 80? So what if they slow down traffic? 
Isn't that what we want? Bricks aren't ugly, they're nostalgic. There's a lot of uh, groups of people who are excited about redoing the, the nostalgia of downtown with the brick streets, and we're going to put in older lamp lights, the turn of the century type architecture. You don't want them more. Bob Elwell is the mayor of Seward. If we can keep the labor costs down with volunteers, I think it's a sound project. But in 88 years, you're just going to have to round up another mess of volunteers and do it again. Well, I won't have to round up another uh, uh, another group of volunteers. Or somebody might have to. <laughs> Mike, these bricks have been here since this town was really just a frontier town. That's right. They uh, actually replaced dirt streets. And these bricks then knew horses and buggies. Absolutely. In fact, some of our volunteers have wondered about exactly what all has gone on on these brick streets. They have a, a long history. Wouldn't it be easier to forget the bricks? Wouldn't it be nice to have modern streets? Wouldn't it be smart to let someone else do the work? Maybe so, but I love the notion of people building their own streets. Will it ever feel the same for these people to drive around their town square knowing that they did this section of brick or that one? This is now their street, not because they paid for it, but because they built it. Oh yeah, it gives them some ownership. For a lot of folks driving through Seward, I suppose this is just ordinary paving, maybe a little bumpier and noisier than usual. But with the knowledge that this is not just like every other street and every other town, some drivers here know that they're rolling over something really quite new and quite old in America, a handmade, homemade street. People used to be one with the earth, and we respected everything that God created. We never took anything that we didn't need. We used everything. If we killed the buffalo, we used the buffalo. We ate the meat. We used the fur for clothing. We even used the, the teeth and the bones for jewelry. You know? What could be more symbolic of an American summer than children at camp learning Native American lore? The difference in this scene, however, is that these children at summer camp in Alliance, Nebraska, are themselves Native Americans. When I was a little boy, I went to summer camp with my Boy Scout troop. We learned how to burn meat over a campfire, just like the Indians. We learned how to braid rope like the Indians. And we even did a little bit of bead work. Once a couple of buddies and I painted our faces and tried to sing and dance like the Indians. We wanted to know what the Indians knew. Back in the old days, when there were Indians. Tokashila, we thank you for being here. Tokashila, I ask you. Well, of course, there still are Indians, and there are still living traditions. I didn't hear it. Okay. Connie Stairs, a Lakota, runs the camp with her husband, Gary, a Winnebago. Uh, my wife and I uh, thought about it for three or four years uh, before we started it, and we wanted to uh, some way to get the children back into the Indian heritage, to to uh, express that that Indian heritage is, is very important to them. Uh, besides the white man, we uh, they should not understand that uh, uh, there is a difference. Now that you, you're in the, in the world, the white man's world of all these luxuries, you know, and I mean like your bikes and the tandos and all this other stuff. See, it takes you away from your heritage. And so, you know, you need this time, you know, just to find peace here in your heart. A lot of the kids that we have here, you know, during our discussions through talking um, about the Indian culture, a lot of them don't know anything, you know, and so that's where we think, you know, we need to bring it back. We need to keep it going. They know they have brown skin, you know, and they know they're Indian. But we had one of the, the little boys say, well, when are them Indians coming from Pine Ridge to dance, you know? So.
Nebraska's Native American population has grown substantially over the past 30 years, and tribes like the Omaha, Lakota, Pawnee, Ponca, and Winnebago are growing not only in numbers, but in political, economic, and cultural strength, too. The problem is the same with Native Americans as with most other American subcultures. I grew up in a German-speaking household, but when I was only four years old, the Second World War came along and German was no longer acceptable. So we spoke English at home. And then I went off to high school and college where my folks had to pay tuition so I could relearn the language that was their mother tongue. Embarrassment, shame, even fear have been a part of growing up Indian in this land. Forgotten were the songs, stories, words, and ways that were once at home here. And in some cases, those who would keep the old ways from dying, not hoping to live in the past, but to carry worthwhile parts of the past into the future, must develop self-conscious systems for preserving and passing along tradition. That's why I say respect each other. Connie, it can be tough being an Indian in the white world. Uh, some people might think that it's a good idea to let these kids forget their heritage rather than relearning it. Well, I guess we, we probably could just let them forget it, but with the experiences that I've had, you know, growing up in this, in, in this town especially, and the prejudice that I went through, you know, um, I wanted to at times, to forget that I was an Indian because of the name callings, you know, uh, dirty, stinking Indian squaw and everything. And I've overcome that because I've come back to my Indian religion, you know, of knowing, you know, who I am and being proud of what I am and who I am. And so it's a healing process, I think, for everybody. It isn't possible in a few days, a few hours, to teach an entire cultural system to young people like this. The weight of the surrounding culture is always there, always pressing, always tempting. But perhaps this summer evening, here in Alliance, Nebraska, some young Native Americans are gaining a respect for ancient ways, ways from which there is still much we could all learn. Thank <laughs> you.